Today we are uh, in Philippians chapter 4. If you have your Bibles and want to follow along, verses 1 through 9. And uh, originally I was going to call this Think on These Things because that's part of the passage. Uh, but as I looked at this passage, uh, I decided the title would be Marks of Maturity. The it seemed like when I first read it, it's just a whole, it's sort of like Proverbs, a whole bunch of sayings, just, and how that, uh, you know, do they even have a connection? But the more I think about it, I think about the fact that you, these are really things that should be character traits for a mature Christian, or any Christian, as far as that goes. Uh, so here are some things that, I think the writer, as we go through this, that you'll see uh, the Apostle Paul is saying, these are to be the measure of Christian maturity. If you were to say, uh, what are the marks? What is the measure of spiritual maturity? I think these will be some things. And the first one is simply this, cooperation. Uh, you know, the Scripture teaches us that, and uh, he says in verse four, uh, chapter 4, verse 1, it begins, Therefore, my brothers and sisters whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way. And so he's going to give us ways that uh, we are to stand firm, and which shows our, our measure of firmness. And he says in verse 2, and uh, these two words uh, are pronounced different ways by different people, but I urge Yodia and I urge Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. And I looked those words up and the pronunciation uh, in about three different ways, and they were pronounced about three different ways in each time I looked. And so we'll do the best with that. Yes, I ask you also, my loyal companion, help these women, for they have struggled beside me in the work of the gospel, together with Clement and the rest of my co-workers, whose names are in the book of life. Now, let's just, a couple things that, that stand out right off the bat. First of all, these were two people, not just two people, but two women who were partners in the gospel with the Apostle Paul. And I know, uh, you know, we, we live... In an area where that's maybe not, a lot of churches don't think that women should be in ministry and all that. But right off the bat, we see that there's two women here that have walked alongside of him in the gospel and have been very important part. And he even calls them co-workers in the gospels, whose names are in the book of life. Very important uh, to the Apostle Paul. However, there seems to be some kind of issue between them now. There is a confrontation, there is a problem, and uh, the Apostle Paul is concerned about that, and he says in uh, verse 5, let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. And I think that is a message to them, but also to every one of us. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. Uh, in the message, uh, it translates it like this. Make it as clear as you can to all you meet that you're on their side, working with them and not against them. Do you get that? Make it as clear to everyone you meet that you're on their side, working with them and not against them. Sometimes we forget that we're really on the same side here. And, and I like that. Uh, an earlier prayer phrase says, let all the world know that you'll meet them halfway. That's something we've forgotten. Uh, you know, this is about hospitality, about welcoming, about inclusion, about the fact that we, we aren't the judge, that we don't point fingers or call names or accuse people. Uh, we dropped our stones a long time ago, ever since Jesus said that only the sinless could throw them. So we aren't looking to pick fights or call names. We're wanting to share in the joy that we have and wanting to realize that we can get along and understand that there are some things that we may not agree on, but we need to agree on what's important. I, you know, one of the, my favorite sayings is that in the essentials, unity, in the non-essentials, liberty, and in all things, charity. In essentials, unity. 
the important things. And the non-essentials, liberty. Let us have the liberty to disagree. But in all things, charity. I think that's a good rule for us to follow in this election year, don't you? As the election draws closer, we understand that uh, the temperature of people's uh, begins to rise. But the problem is we built walls of defense between one another. And the arrows are flying on social media. You know, people are just uh, just dropping deadly arrows. And uh, people in the United States, it seems like that we, we're inhabiting two different worlds now. I mean, we watch two different news uh, companies. We're reading two different newspapers. We're, uh, we're ha hearing different radio talk shows, different opinions, different ways of life. And depending on what particular political persuasion you are is the one you listen to. It seems to me that we're, the whole country are divided into two camps. And there is a serious lack of healthy debate and dialogue in our country that we once had. Uh, we seem to divide it in two camps, the liberals versus the conservatives, the Republicans versus the Democrats. And, and, and I think that the problem, uh, and the problem with this is that uh, we've gone above to the point where uh, I, I think politics, we put politics above mercy and above humanity. And, about, and above love for one another in, in our country, to the point that we can't even, our country can't even seem to come together during a pandemic to work things out without being, making that political, if you will. Well, it seems like we've hit a new low, but in the Philippian church, this conflict that was going on between Yodia and Syntyche seems to have bothered Paul to the point where he was uh, writing about it and sending out letters. But in spite of their differences, Paul is encouraging them to, uh, the, the wording there in the Greek is to be of the same mind. And literally, I encourage you to think the same thing. In other words, that we are to come together and, and to in essentials have unity and in the non-essentials, liberty. That's really what it's saying. And in all things, charity. John Wesley said it like this. You've heard it before. Though we cannot think alike, may we not love alike. May we not be of one heart, though we are not of one opinion. Without all doubt, we may. Herein all the children of God may unite, notwithstanding these smaller differences. Good advice. And so I think that the writer here is saying that, uh, especially in, in the Christian life and in the church, that we should cooperate. And one of the marks of maturity is that we do that. In fact, uh, he would write somewhere else that when there is division, that's not a sign of maturity, but spiritual immaturity and car carnality. And it's, it's a time when we just basically, the old preacher said, let the devil in. And, and that's not good. So cooperation. The second one is celebration. This is something that should be a part of the Christian life. He says in verse 4, Rejoice in the Lord. What's that word there? Always. Again, I say rejoice. Celebration. You know, as I read this and I think about this, I think, you know, I, there is one word in that I have a little bit of a problem with. That word is always, Brother Mark. I mean, I think if he hadn't put that word in there, it would be so much easier. But always, I mean, if he'd have said, rejoice in the Lord some of the time, well, yeah, that's, that's doable and that makes sense. That, you know, I'm going to rejoice in the Lord because God has blessed me. If he'd have said, rejoice in the Lord most of the time, I could live with that, you know, to say, well, yeah, um, God's been good to me and I've had more blessings than heartaches or, you know, whatever. But that's not where he says. He says, rejoice in the Lord always. Really? Really, Brother Paul? Are we supposed to rejoice in the Lord always, church? Are we supposed to rejoice in the Lord always? 
That's what he says. Uh, let's read it again. Rejoice in the Lord always. Not sometimes. Not part of the time. Not most of the time. But all the time. That's not so easy to do. But the idea there, I think, is really that, that there, there are always, always things that we can give God thanks for. We can always look around and see someone in worse shape than we are. And we can always realize that even in the worst of times that God is working things in our lives. And God is blessing. Romans 5.3 says, more than that, we rejoice in our sufferings. Knowing that our suffering produces endurance. It sounds crazy in a way. But the fact that we can find something to be thankful for and to thank God even in the midst of our suffering is a mark of maturity. This is not every Christian, by the way. It's a mark of spiritual maturity. The other day I visited a man who wanted me to come back and talk to him in the hospital. He had had heart surgery. And normally when someone asks me to come back, they're asking for something. Either uh, they want to get saved, uh, baptized, or they want uh, maybe a guest tray or something. But when I went to this fellow, he didn't really want anything. He said, I just want to share my testimony with you of how good God has been to me. And he went back and he talked about how that God had blessed his business and, and, and brought him through and so many times and God saved his soul and just began to cry and to thank God in the midst of this hospital room and a hospital bed he was praising God and giving God thanks I stood at the bed of a man who's dying his wife and family gathered around this man's an old regular Baptist preacher and they asked me to sing Beulah Land. And we got around and we began to sing Beulah Land. And we all got a little teary-eyed as we sang that verse, I'm looking out across the river to where my faith shall end in sight. There's just a few more days to labor that I will take my heavenly flight. And as I think about the words that the Apostle Paul are writing here, Rejoice in the Lord always. I'll remind you, as Samantha already did, that he's writing these words from a cold prison dungeon. As he's talking about rejoicing and giving thanks to God, he's not talking about it while he's on top of the world, but while he's in prison. Rejoice in the Lord always. And I think that when we can get to the place where we find a reason to thank God in the midst of time, the toughest times in our life, then we understand that we're, we're maturing and we're growing in the Lord. And then number three, another thing that's a, a, a sign of maturity is communication, particularly communication with God. Look what he says in verse 6. Do not worry about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Tell God everything. Tell it to Jesus. Tell it to Jesus. The old song, sweet hour of prayer, sweet hour of prayer that calls us from a world of care. And that song, I think we're going to sing that a little bit, uh, is on page 496. We're not going to sing it yet, but I just want to point out something about it. Uh, as you look at it, it, it uh, uses, says the words are William Walford, but uh, the way the actual story goes was uh, this appeared in the New Yorker years ago, and uh, supposedly the words were penned by a blind preacher. There's no account of this particular blind preacher. But the words are so, so important. Sweet hour of prayer, the sweet hour of prayer that calls me from a world of care and bids me at my Father's throne make all my wants and wishes known. In seasons of distress and grief, my soul has often found relief and oft escaped the tempter's snare by thy return, sweet hour of prayer. 
In everything, give thanks to God. Pray about everything and give requests unto God. The peace of God, he says, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Jesus Christ. So that when we give it to God, then we let it go. I was talking uh, in our, one of our devotions the other day at the, at the hospital when we do our workplace devotions about uh, my dog Toby and how that we, uh, we, he likes to play fetch and he'll bring things to me or we, you know, a stick or whatever uh, or a ball and he'll bring it to me. The problem is that when he brings it to me, he doesn't want to let go. He wants to hold on to it. And so we get into this tug of war where, uh, you know, we're going back and forth. I'm like, Toby, if you want to play fetch, you've got to let it go. You know, sometimes we're like that with God. You know, we take our troubles to God and we, we tell Him about it. And God says, let me have those problems, but we don't really let go. We walk out of the church with the same burdens that we came in. The altar is not used anymore because we don't think that we need to. Or maybe we're afraid that if we go up there and pray, somebody's going to think there's something wrong with us. No wonder our country's in the shape that it's in today in our world. But, you know, the thing is, God teaches us time and time again that we should never be ashamed or feel like that we're so prideful that we can't bow before Him and ask Him to help us with our problems. Sometimes maybe just, you know, the Bible talks about calling the brothers and sisters of the church. Say, I need you to pray for me. Maybe lay hands on me. The Bible talks about healing, but there's more than just physical healing. There's spiritual healing, emotional healing. That's a, that as well. And, and you know, we're, we're not above doing that, are we, church? We, we pray for people. We anoint people. Because of the oil, even though it's just a bottle of oil, it represents the Holy Spirit. Communication with God's important. And number four, finally, is contemplation. He says in verse 8, Finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Keep on doing the things that you've learned and received and heard and seen in me, and the God of peace shall be with you. So whatever is true, honorable, lovely, just, pure, all these things that are wholesome and healthy are the things that we should be filling our minds with. It's important because God understands that the thoughts and the things that we put into our minds also affect our lives. We see it every day. We see the effects of, especially with our young people, of how the things that, you know, the violence and the things that they take in uh, do sort of play out in negative ways a lot of time. Some of the th times, the things that we hear and we look and, you know, we think about social media and all this and how they, they make us feel like we don't measure up. And we look at people with their perfect pictures and their filtered pictures and we think, why, why don't I look like that? Or why doesn't my house look like that? Or why doesn't my family seem to appear like that? And it's kind of just like, well, I just don't feel like I measure up. And, and yet God says I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I think of that song, you say I am loved when I can't feel a thing. You say I am strong when I think I am weak. You say I am held when I am falling short and when I don't belong. You say I am yours. I believe. I believe what you say of me. And it's time we start believing what God says. What God says of us, how much He loves us. It's time we stop listening to the world and those around us tell us what we ought to look like and how we ought to act and how we ought to be and realize that God loves us. And we need to contemplate and fill our minds with things that are honorable and just and pure. And that's all of us. I'm not just pointing fingers at you. I'm, I'm also talking about myself. We all need to fill our minds with things that are wholesome because we realize how much they do have an effect on us in our lives and in our actions. 
And so these are some things just uh, the Apostle Paul was throwing out there that, that could help us if we want to look at what we want to do in order to move toward maturity. What are the things that you're doing to grow and to be stronger in the Lord? And what are the things that you're allowing into your life, into your heart, into your mind? Those are things that I believe will make a difference in growth in the Christian life. I'm going to ask the musicians to come up. We're going to sing. Page 496. As we come and sing, the invitation is open as always for you to come and to pray. If there's somebody that just wants the prayers of the church, if somebody wants, uh, you know, to come up and just pray at the altar, uh, you know, we invite you to come with a mask, but we invite you to come today and pray.